Hello, good morning, everyone. I am super excited that you decided to spend your morning with us learning about machine learning at the edge. My name is Stacy Higginbotham. I am the founder and editor of Stacy on IoT and the Internet of Things podcast. And I am so happy that y'all are here. So first up, I want to tell everybody that this is a new platform and I have some pointers to help you navigate it. It's not difficult, but it is a little bit different, but it's also super fun. So on the left is a navigation bar, and that's where you're going to get to the different areas of the event. Right now, we are on the stage. There's also an expo area where you can visit sponsors, and there's a networking tab. And if you click to that, you will actually be able to randomly network for three minutes with anybody who is also here. And that is going to be with video and audio. So it's kind of like being in a real conference. Uh, on the right is the chat function. And when we ask for questions, you should put the questions in the chat. And Kevin, who is floating around as an organizer, he's got a big blue legit looking tag above his name. He is the gentleman who will be pulling those for me uh, to ask our panelists at the end of each session. Uh, Kevin is also there just to help people navigate and watch out for anything questionable. So please behave yourself, be kind to one another. Uh, I don't see this as a horribly contentious topic, but be, be kind. And anything that you type in the chat is going to be public. In the center, is the stage, which is where we are now. And we are gonna be hosting breaks in which you will be able to network and visit the expo where you can find all that sponsor information. And they will be 10 minutes long. So buy a break, water, do whatever you need to do. And with the expo, you just click on a link in each one and you can request more information about the company. Uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from our sponsors at the top of each session, so you can decide if you want to learn more. It is important to know that when you click out of, well, when you click on these areas, you're going to be clicking out of the main stage. And so just to get back, you just go back to the stage when sessions start. It's possible that when you click back that you might have to hit play to restart it, but I'm pretty sure you can all do that. I feel like that was a lot more than just telling you about the Wi-Fi password, which is my normal welcoming notes for the event. But hopefully you have that. Kevin and Andrew are both around to help if you have questions. And now I would love to take a moment to say, machine learning is a big deal. We've been talking about it for the last oh, eight, ten to, eight to 10 years. And we mostly talk about it with training and doing things in the cloud. But what's really exciting about what's happening is we're bringing it out to the edge. And your version of the edge may differ from someone else's version. And we actually have a poll going right now that you can vote on where you think the edge is. I don't really think it matters. I think the practical elements here are that we're bringing intelligence, all the way from the cell network to your servers on premise to the very sensors that are trying to pull in information and make inferences. And that's what this sh this conference is about. We're gonna be talking about businesses and how they're using it and a little bit about how the technology is going to work and what it will enable. So I want to thank our sponsors for hosting or helping me host this event. Our sponsors are Perceive, Avnet, an edge impulse. And right now I have Zach Shelby, the CEO of Edge Impulse, who is going to be coming up in just a moment to talk to us a little bit about what Edge Impulse does before we kick off to our primary panel or our first panel of the day. Oh, Zach, welcome. Hi, Stacey, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for coming. So I will hush up for a moment and let you share what Edge Impulse is doing. Perfect. 
Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining the ML at the Edge event with um, Stacy and all of our speakers. My name is Zach Shelby, and I'm the CEO of Edge Impulse. And I'm just going to share one graphic with you because I think it's really neat to see what's coming together in this space and how we're enabling um, developers to make use of machine learning on embedded targets. Um, TinyML technology has opened up amazing new opportunities in this space. Uh, we brought down the complexity of deep neural networks and other machine learning techniques to the point where we can use machine learning on common Cortex-M targets, Cortex-M4, Cortex-M7, or CPUs. And that unlocks incredible ranges of applications using real-time sensor data, audio, even images and video across industrial applications, predictive maintenance, enterprise applications, for example, asset tracking, and into wearables, um, health monitoring, um, worker monitoring, uh, people's movements in facilities, and even agriculture and animal tracking. So the applications are endless. The types of data that we can process with the technology is endless. Um, at Edge Impulse, our goal is really simple. We're here to enable developers and engineers to access the technology and make it easy to not only get started, but get this to deployment in real embedded IoT products. So I am going to be around in the expo area. I'll be live for the next two hours um, teaching people about this, answering questions about technology or about applications, and even giving live demos and tutorials. So come over to the expo area when you get a chance and come talk to me there. Thank you. All right, Zach, thank you so much for that. And thank you once again for sponsoring the event. All right, everyone. Now, I have a couple things to remind everyone about because we're learning as we go here. Uh, we are, please do not use the Twitter hashtag in the chat because apparently it crashes the uh, program or it can crash the program, so let's not do that. And then the hashtag is EdgeMLEvent for sharing on Twitter, and we're welcoming our panelists on stage um, shortly. You probably can wave hi, everybody. And then the other thing to note is when you click over to do something like networking or the expo, you're going to lose the audio for the main stage. And that's because you're going to a different area. It's just like leaving the conference and moving over to do something else. So stick with us, there will be breaks. Okay, everyone's assembled. This is our panel on, uh, sorry, explaining the edge. What is the edge and why are we using it? And I'm just gonna introduce my panelists. I have Peter Zornio, who is at Emerson. He is the CTO over there. I have Julian Sanchez, who is with John Deere. And we, he's going to talk about using the edge for precision agriculture. And then I have Dr. Karen Panetta, who is the Dean of Engineering at Tufts University and has some excellent projects to talk about. So welcome everyone, thank you. And let's just get this started with, we'll start with you, Julian, because you're right next to me here on stage, technically. Uh, how do you define the edge? So imagine driving through the Midwest, if you've ever done it, let's say central Illinois, Nebraska, whichever Midwest state you want to put yourself in, and it's flat, flat open ground, and you, you're looking out in a field. And now imagine a big, big tractor pulling a big, big planter um, that was happening here in the last couple of months. And let's say we're planting uh, soybeans. You know, that planter is putting down about uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 seeds per second into the ground. And within each of those seconds, within each of those 1,500 seeds that are being put down in the ground, the, the machine, this, the tractor and the planter, is having to sense, make decisions, and adjust in real time. Right. And, and many times in areas with uh, very, very poor uh, connectivity, broadband connectivity. So, you know, for us at John Deere, when we think of edge, we think of uh, outdoor, messy environments where our machines are 
having to sense, decide, and act uh, all within less than a second, and in some cases, less than half a second. And, and why we're making those adjustments, we're making sure that the machines are doing the job as best as possible. They're putting those seats exactly where they need to be placed, uh, in the right depth, in the right, in the right place in the field, so that ultimately the crops can be as productive and, and, and end up with as much yield as possible. So that's, that's in, a, in, a, in a short you know, story edge for us. It's, it's messy, it's very, very much real time, and it's about helping uh, crops uh, yield and be as productive as possible. Okay, uh, thank you. And Peter, what are you guys doing at the edge? Actually, so I, I should come back, hold on. Julian, sounds like your edge is on a tractor or a combine or giant big agriculture equipment. That's correct, that's correct. Okay. Okay, Peter, where is your edge and what are y'all doing with it? Well, if, if Julian's is on uh, farming equipment, our edge is on manufacturing equipment. So uh, whether you're looking at manufacturing pharmaceuticals or producing paper or any kind of manufacturing, we're in the business of, of automating those facilities and increasingly we're in the business of analyzing and diagnosing what's going on in those facilities. So I think this question about what is the edge in the manufacturing world is kind of an interesting one because frankly, the manufacturing world has been using the edge for quite a long time from a control perspective in terms of having devices out in the manufacturing environment that are connected physically to sensors to control what's going on. Now, increasing what we're doing is using them to diagnose what's happening, advance things like energy consumption, reliability. And if you ask somebody in manufacturing about the edge, I think for sure, they would all say if it's running in the sensor or if it's running in a computing device that's actually mounted in the manufacturing world connected to those sensors, that's clearly the edge. If you ask them about the cloud, they say, okay, yeah, I know what the cloud is, right? The cloud, uh, you know, if it's in a public cloud or to them, even if it's running in like their corporate data center, you know, to them, that would be considered more like cloud kind of, you know, environment. There's kind of a gray area about when we talk about on-premise computing. So if you have, you know, it could be potentially very high performance like server, but if it's running on the factory floor or inside the same facility, you know, is that the edge or not the edge, right? So that's that's the one area that I think as we talk to customers that maybe is fits into the gray zone of, you know, is that considered the edge or not? If it's physically there in the in the facility, but not necessarily accessed, you know, over over the internet. Does that definition matter? Before we get to Karen, does that definition matter to anyone? No, I actually think it does not. I think that it really kind of boils down to you do the data processing and computing and analysis at just wherever it makes sense based on a number of factors I'm sure we're gonna talk a lot more about today. Awesome, okay, Karen, let us yeah. hear from you about what you are doing at the edge. Sure. So I, my, first of all, my definition sounds very much like Peter's. The edge computing really is determining the best way to distribute computing to make your data and processes always available, fast, efficient, and secure. And that often means by, you know, capturing the data, processing it, and analyzing it closest to where the data is generated. In my world, I'm doing a lot of life critical applications. So, you know, I'm doing elephant conservation. So we're, you know, flying drones over uh, parks to keep poaches at bay. We are looking at wildlife conservation. And we're also doing things with first responders. So I'm, if, if I have something in a cloudy, smoky environment, firefighting environment, I couple my image processing, which removes the smoke and provides better visibility I really need real-time, instantaneous, reliable information immediately. So my edge has to be usually at the sensor or right on that device. Got it. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And so we, we talked a little bit about what you're doing. We're probably going to get into that. Um, a lot of people think about edge computing and they're like, Everything's going to the edge. I, I think I've seen stats saying that like 70% mm -hmm. of computing will be at the edge and that's either IDC or Gartner. Um, and this is kind of a shift from everything being in the cloud. But I, I'm curious, I know we're focusing on the edge here, but 
what are you doing in the cloud? How do you communicate? Because I don't hear, I, I really don't think anyone's going to be like, I'm all edge all the time. So how does that pendulum swing? How does that communication happen? Karen, you want to just give us a start on that? So usually I, I use the cloud mostly for getting, uh, you know, data, you know, worldwide types of access to databases and things like that, because we'll be talking about data. But if, if, if I can get stuff out there and I pull in what I need to do my training in the background, that's what I normally use it for or for updates on, um, you know, something current, some other types of weather or things like that. I might pull it from from the cloud. But other than that. I'm trying to do all my processing more local on the edge. Got it. And Julian? Yeah. Um, again, we we try to make that distinction as a function of how, what is the urgency of the decision? And, and again, we this isn't perfect, but I, I really like to think of it as any decision that needs to be made within a second uh, while a tractor or a combine, a harvesting combine is in the field, that's edge for us. Any decision that the, that the farmer can make over the span of a day or maybe in the off season, then we say, well, you know, let's not, let's not overly focus on edge. Let's just focus then on connectivity and figure out a way to get that data or that information back to the cloud and give the farmer a way to process that information and uh, and make decisions that, that we don't consider real time. So again, we put that lens of how urgent are the decisions that need to be made and less than a second edge, more than a second likely we'll, we'll start considering the cloud route. I You must have great broadband connectivity because more than a second, I'm like, Eddie, uh, <laughs> Like, is that like five minutes or is that like two seconds? Yeah, so that's a great point. You know, um, broadband connectivity in rural areas is still a huge challenge for uh, agriculture. And so, uh, you know, I know there's uh, always a lot of buzz about the 5G discussion, you know, and, and for us, the, the we, we're actively participants at the, at the federal and legislative le uh, levels on, on 5G. For us, 5G is an opportunity to provide coverage. Certainly bandwidth, certainly latency are, are interesting to us, but for us, it's about coverage. And, and because it's been so inconsistent in all parts of the world, uh, our mindset and how we architect our solutions has always been more of a, a store and push type of architecture. So we always, we always start almost every discussion assuming we will not have real-time connectivity and if we do need real-time connectivity, and again, I'm thinking real-time, less than a second, then we'll have to come up with point-to-point -point solutions like radios or things like that. And otherwise, we can say, yeah, there's there's areas where we we can rely on the cloud as the as the means of communication, but but certainly it cannot be mission critical. Gotcha. Okay, and this is a new platform, so we're having some fun, exciting difficulties here, um, but. Y'all are doing great, my panelists, and I hope the audience appreciates their like struggling a little bit here. But I do want to ask Peter about using the cloud. And so, Peter, can you tell me how Emerson is thinking about the cloud in relation to everything that it is doing at the edge? Yeah. So for us, you know, the cloud really is for those bigger problems. So we we fundamentally what we do is we look at I would say individual pieces of equipment or individual subsystems with, in some cases, actual sensor-based uh, models that are running and, and diagnosing what's going on or feeding uh, more of a edge of physically connected device to those things. And it's kind of the boil up of the results of those that go into the cloud where we look at like an overall manufacturing facility or potentially compare what's happening across multiple manufacturing facilities. And sometimes that data is also useful for helping you come back and fine tune the models that are actually running at the lower level because you can compare what's going on at the results from uh, top to bottom. Awesome. All right. Let us talk about your challenges. And I would love to hear from Karen. Let's talk about the firefighting. And I know you're, that, that seems like a really tough environment. It is. So. It is. It is. So, so, yeah. yeah. Oh. So the first thing is, communications are the first thing to go you know their their radios um melt uh and, and you know they're so dependent on those communications so one of the things that we look at is 
you know, almost like fault tolerance or triple redundancy so that if communications fails, how can I still get information to the firefighter to either get the heck out of there or, you know, um, the person you're looking for is not in this building. You don't need to be here. And that's one, one aspect of it. The other thing that people don't realize is there's a lot going around, not just uh, trying to see through the images of the smoke and find people, but they're also, um, one of, they, they also have to look at the fire hoses. They actually, there's been tremendous deaths. The fire hoses explode. Whoa. And, and that's something, you know, you don't, you don't hear about it, but a lot of deaths are due to fire hoses exploding. They get too hot and they, they you know, um, the pressure builds up and that's usually, um, you know, it's, it's a life critical thing. So we're trying to use all this information around them, not just with temperature sensing to tell them but also looking at their their own bio statistics because they can have um, the heat themselves can cause a heart attack. So again, these types of things, if you can't communicate that to the outside person, you need to be able to do that processing right there quickly and, and be able to give them some sort of feedback. So I'm giving them some sort of haptic feedback right now to try to tell them, even if communications are down, you need to get out. So that's all super local. That's happening in a super hot environment. And the hardware, is it specialized? Is it? I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you, you really need specialized hardware that can tolerate that heat. And we also look at other ways of, you know, um, what, what, how am I going to communicate this? So we also look at who's close by to be able to, if, if I can't hear you outside, maybe somebody in my local area can. So again, you've got this networking going on to, uh, um, lo more localized than trying to go out to your, you know, your Wi-Fi. A lot of people say, well, why don't they just use their cell phones? The firefighters don't want to take their own cell phones into a fire, would you? So, you know, there's some common sense types of things. But our challenges are getting, you know, the hardware to work in these extreme environments in the sensors. Okay. And Julian, you have kind of an extreme environment too. I just, you know, fields, dirt, water. Yeah, uh, it sounds familiar, Karen. Um, you know, we we test a lot of uh, consumer off-the-shelf technology that works very nicely in sixty percent of use cases. Um, and so that that for sure is a business challenge for us. You know, how to scale some of the new tech. You know, everything from having to really investigate and invest a lot of energy trying to figure out. You know, how do we keep the, the, the lens of these camera systems uh, when we're using machine vision, how do we keep them clean? How do we tell the operator or the farmer, hey, you ought to go out there and kind of wipe that down. Um, turns out farmers uh, sometimes go deep into the evening in farming. And so it's not just the daytime activity. So all of a sudden your, your, your edge sensors have to be able to accommodate, you know, daylight and, and night conditions and, uh, and everything in between. So for sure, that is, a, that is also, a, I think, a, a serious, serious business challenge. I think the other, the other aspect for us, which is just an ongoing discussion in terms of challenges and how we scale our, our intelligence uh, uh, at the edge is, You've got to figure out a way to hit the sweet spot in how complex and how sophisticated of an AI model you use. And so, you know, of course, in the last several years, we've all uh, we've all, in some cases, fallen in, in love with uh, with deep learning algorithms, and they work really, really well. Um, at the same time, they also requ require higher levels of processing and edge processing in very hot and rugged conditions. And so it's actually trying to, as a, as a manufacturing company, educate ourselves and get uh, proficient at finding the sweet spot of sometimes you don't need a deep learning algorithm at the edge making decisions. Sometimes it's okay to have a one layer algorithm making decisions if you're just trying to detect, you know, hey, there's something big or there's something small. But if you're trying to detect, is this really a weed or is this really a, a, a corn plant, you know, in a, in a dusty condition, then you might need a very sophisticated algorithm. So that's, that's definitely an evolution that we're going through right now. Much like, you know, we over the years got comfortable about deciding what kind of materials we should use for a tractor. Now we're trying to learn and, and figure out what kind of uh, AI algorithms we should apply at the edge. 
Uh, it sounds like Karen may have an opinion about what kind of algorithm should be applied at the edge. So I'll, I'll let you tackle that right now, Karen, and then, sure. then we'll move over to Peter to talk about. Sure. So, so one of my biggest challenges, you know, uh, that everybody thinks is, you know, deep learning is the end all be all. I think, you know, I, I, I joke, I'm not in love with it, Julian, because I look at it as like, you know, those parameters that need to be trained, the timing, but I always look at it as, I want to know what's going on inside. And I think there's a move now that you have to be able to explain what the AI is going to do. So inside, you know, there's like ethical things like you need to understand what's going on inside the AI. But I look at one of the biggest things I like to do is I like to figure out how can I better train or come up with, you know, um, more efficiency so I don't even need deep learning. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now is coming up with algorithms that are based on human visual systems using simple non-floating point operators no parameters, and I am getting it back down to just machine learning. And I think that that's some of the things as I'm looking at those efficiencies. But yeah, I'm, I'm not in love with, it, with deep learning. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know if I've ever thought if I was in love with deep learning or not. Uh, Peter, let's, let's talk to you about the challenges that you deal with. Obviously, factories are also rugged environments, so it sounds like we all are dealing with those issues. But what else is specific for your use cases? Yeah, well, I would actually like to build on something Karen oh, said as well. well. You, you go like right ahead first, then. Is, I, don't, I don't know if it's, if I'm being a heretic here since, you know, we, we started out saying machine learning, but I have to say that a lot of our edge applications uh, are based on, in many cases, first principles kinds of models. So if we take like an example of diagnosing what's happening inside of a pump, well, we know flow curves in a pump. We know the you know hydro hydraulic modules of how a pump works and everything we know the key variables the trick is actually getting all of those together and running them through an algorithm to come up with an overall result and doing that in, in real time so we don't always use just again as karen said we don't always use machine learning we end up using machine learning when we're tackling other problems where we don't have good first principle models to solve so a, a great example is we have an acoustic sensor that we can use to do a lot of different things it could figure out if uh if there's a leak happening in a pipe or it could figure out if a steam trap is working properly or a pressure relief valve is open those are all different things that we've trained it to do based on machine learning because you know again that it, that's not something we have a we only have an acoustic signature to work with at that point. So then we apply machine learning. So that, this is a bit of a hot button of mine is that everybody loves machine learning and machine learning is a great technology, but don't forget to use when you have them, you know, first principles and, and actual causal relationships. Many times it's just, you don't have the data to work those. So uh, again, just kind of a hot button. To answer your specific question, I think, you know, communication was already mentioned. Uh, obviously, ruggedness is a big deal, as you already said for us. I mean, you know, one of the environments we work in, uh, for instance, is, let's say, offshore oil and gas, right? So if you can imagine having to have a sensor mounted on a platform in the North Sea, being splashed by salt water, having to run 24-7, you know, for three years or five years off of a battery, that's not your average you know, outdoor temperature sensor that we all have at our house, okay, that, that's talking wirelessly. So, and then the communication challenges are a big deal that, that go along with that and and putting in the specific uh, low power wireless infrastructure, which is another favorite topic of yours, I know, Stacy. Many of the same technologies that are used in the home, you know, whether it's uh, 802 15 4 base networks like Zigbee or in our case, Wireless Heart or low, you know, uh, LoRa or whatever those networks are, that's often a big challenge is having those things in place just to get the data so that we can do the the edge computing that you'd like to do or to have the sensors themselves executed, as I said. That's true, because a lot of, I, I we probably think of machine learning at the edge happening like in one place, but what's really happening is lots of data is usually traveling over some network to get mm -hmm. to that. And even if that network's like a wired network on a combine, or a wireless network that might be a, a local mesh network for a firefighter or for you, wireless heart. I was wondering if you were gonna put that in there, oh, the industrial standard there. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, there's this, y'all made a distinction about models and algorithms versus just, you know, just using basic data and like applying anomaly detection or something like that. Uh, 
But let's talk about your data challenges and how you train at the edge, how you shrink the models. I mean, this is this is hard. So how do you think about this? If you're a business manager and you're like, I want to do edge learning in my business, how do they attack the data problem? And I don't know who I should ask. Uh, let's go with uh, Peter, you just spoke. So Julian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the training question for us is fascinating because again, if you, if you think about the types of training of the models that we're trying to do, we are trying to train the models on you know, what does a seed look like? Um, what does a plant or a weed look like? And, and at first that might seem like, well, you know, a seed is a seed and a weed is a weed and a plant is a plant. Um, and yet, you know, I always joke, um, I, I, I say you can, you can go from one field to another field, another farm that's only 30 miles away and uh, in the same state, roughly the same conditions and stuff just looks different. Right. And so um, the, the, the challenge uh, to scale training is, you know, as we know, AI is great at interpolating. It's not great at extrapolating. And so the challenge for us is this, this, this ever uh, or nonstop effort to try to show the model examples of what seeds that, you know, corn seeds look like in India or corn seeds look like in the Midwest or what does a weed look like in Southern Illinois versus in Mississippi? And, and trying to show it as many examples. So, so it's a matter of, um, I mean, the technology is the technology, but we've had to build a, a set of processes and approaches where we can deploy as many uh, cameras and as many sensors simply for the function of training the models and showing them as broad a variability of examples as possible. I think to us, that's been the secret sauce of achieving success in the space of, of AI and intelligence on the edge. Which is basically training, it's gathering your own data and then training your models yourselves with your own data scientists. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, so, you know, we've been asked sometimes like what, I mean, we've deployed a few um, a few products already with uh, convolutional neural nets, and like our our harvesting combine has a very sophisticated system that takes pictures of the grain going through the machine and can can tell in real time whether that grain is is damaged or whether there's a lot of dirt in there and makes adjustments immediately. And so, so for sure, we've invested in the hardware and the software and the technology. Part of what I think is setting us apart in terms of you know this deploying intelligence to the edge in agriculture is we've built a really really robust set of training uh, training data whether they be pictures and we're able to correlate the pictures with reality and you know just because we have so many machines out there in all parts of the world that in some ways has become one of our um, one of the dimensions of our competitive advantage. Oof. Okay, that that's bodes ill for people who want to do this broadly. <laughs> uh, Karen, actually, we'll we'll start with you because you probably don't have the ability to. Well, and I don't know if fires are different everywhere in the world. So, what are well, your data challenges? Well, it's, 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 I think there's a couple of things. You, Julian, hit, you know, the nail on the head. You know, he knows his seeds and his weeds. And and for me, when I'm I'm not a firefighter, I don't know my data. So, and I'm and and so my big thing is annotation getting annotated types of data. So I do a lot of cancer analysis using image processing. And one of the things that I always have a problem with is, you know, we ask six or seven different doctors, you know, what what is this cancer? And, and usually they can say yes or no, but then if you ask them to grade it, I get variations all over the place. So how am I supposed to train if I don't have a consistent, it's this grade. So that's kind of scary in one sense. But the other thing that is goes on is the disparate sets of data. So I work a lot on data fusion because if I have a sensor for temperature and something coming in for weather and then something coming in on um, you know body temperature or an image is coming in, um, I call it multimodal types of data. And I and it's not just you know regular cameras. Maybe it's thermal, infrared. You know all these different types of, of sensors that are out there. How do you register all that information? How do you extract what's most important? from each image and fuse that. And those are some of the challenges that I actually work on. I've come up with measures to automate it in artificial learning because you can't have a human in the loop. And right now, a lot of people 
still have to do all this annotation by hand or by by humans. Yeah, you even have grad students. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my Peter. Cloud, yes. Exactly, uh, Peter. What about how you guys are dealing with data? How you're thinking about yeah. how to help others? So most of the time we're doing, I, I think, kind of similar to Julian. We know the problems that we're trying to solve, right? We're, you know, we're going to deliver a solution to our customers that is going to tell you, you know, when there's corrosion happening on a pipe based on the machine learning we did with the sensor that's working on that, or is going to tell you when you have a, a steam trap that's, you know, that's failed shut or, or whatever. So it's, it's our own people that are doing a lot of the work here and trying to train the models. Um, we do also have somewhat the problem he described where from situation to situation can be different, which is why we go to different industries, different facilities, you know, and try to get that elusive, you know, 99.99%, you know, accuracy that, that the model is, is hit it, you know, just right every time. And depending on the problem, we can get pretty close. We do have a few customers, the, the more advanced brave souls who, you know, are doing some of this themselves. And, you know, we actually, you know, offer them a platform to do that as well. Like uh, for, for our factory automation customers, we, we have one of our control devices, a PLC, which is a well-known thing in the factory automation space that has a whole, we use one of the whole other cores just for them to run an open, uh, you know, Linux operating system and run whatever machine learning kind of tools and stuff they want to do against the data that's coming in on the other side that a deterministic control processor that, you know, an set of algorithms that we have provided is doing the control, but then the other side, they're able to go in and and play around with doing whatever machine learning and whatever environment they want to do to, to try to figure some things out themselves. But so far, that's been a, a fairly limited set of the of the of the more advanced, you know, do it yourself or kind of customers. As I said, most of them are looking for us to to provide them with with as we like to call it, you know, known solutions to known problems. OK, things where we know what it is you're trying to figure out. And we've we've provided the models and trained them for them. Okay, and and this actually gets to my next question: is, you know, the idea of the edge is super hyped, but it's also highly customized. It feels like I mean, you're talking about gathering your own data, building for like individual uh, geographies. Peter, you've got people who are like, I just want to buy a, a solution, and some people who are dealing with these like. I'll call them edge cases, like long tail. I, I'm so sorry, y'all. Okay, but the idea here is, is this something you can buy off the shelf and still gain value? Or will your competitors always, who, who actually nail the edge cases at the edge, will they beat you? I mean, from a business perspective, how important is it to go fully custom? Any Anyone's thoughts, raise your hand and I'll answer. Go, Karen. <laughs> I, I was going to say that I do believe there will be solutions uh, like um, that you can prepackage and have an AI solution. The big difference is going to be, you know, who has access or who generates the best data. If you know you have a company, your data might be proprietary. Why are you going to give that to somebody else to develop their own solutions? So you know that's the big thing. Is yes, eventually we will have um, robust solutions for people to deploy in manufacturing using imaging and things like that, but it's all going to come down to, are you going to be willing to share your data with other companies? Julian. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I think the, the scaling will, will continue to be driven in part by, we'll call it some of the foundational blocks. So certainly you hear a lot about new advancements in bringing, bringing the computing and the sensing closer together so that you're not having to think of those two things as separate modules, right? So, you, so sensors or cameras that are built with in in you know keeping in mind what kind of decisions they're going to have to make immediately and bringing those two pieces together. I think as as that technology or that dimension evolves, that'll make it more scale. But but actually, uh, so I my training is in, in in psychology, and I always think of the edge very much in terms of the human human mind and how we process information. The power of the edge is being able to detect context. I mean, that's what makes it special, right? Being able to to tell subtleties and make decisions in real time. That's what humans are great at, and so. 
I do think this this uh, this dimension of having you know kind of unique data, unique solutions for those unique edge cases and situations will continue to be always this important piece of this edge discussion. And so the more data that you can collect, the more data that you can have, the more you can understand what are the decisions you're trying to impact in real time. That's what will differentiate edge, you know, one edge solution from another. Um, and, and yeah, the cameras and the processing will enable that to, to, to be developed faster, but ultimately it's that secret sauce is understanding where, what that edge decision entails, much the way humans develop that intelligence of making those real time uh, decisions. Okay, and instead of going straight to Peter, I'm gonna go to my next question and then go to Peter. Surprise, Peter. Um, all right, so next question, and after this, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience and I have a few already in queue, but um, just briefly, what would you like to be doing at the edge that you can't do today? What are the use cases you're like, oh, I really wanna do this, and maybe what are the technical limitations? Yeah, sure, I think that, you know, I already mentioned one of the big technical limitations, which is which can be around communication. Just, you know, we can maybe put the the compute horsepower and even get some of the sensing. But, you know, many of the facilities we're servicing are, are very geographically distributed. Uh, you know, there may be over acres of, of space and always and having the, the connection you'd like to have to get the resources out of there. It can be an issue. Uh, there's always, frankly, the biggest thing is is the business case around what it is you're going to generate with the data and what problem you're going to solve i mean it just like all of these things it still always comes down to that um you know what are you know what is the actual value going to be you know of when you're actually able to solve that problem so i think a good example maybe of one in our industries that people have wanted for a long time i kind of mentioned this earlier is corrosion right that was you know a very manual thing for our customers to figure out manual inspections, uh, drones is now a new technology that can be used for some of that, but that's also not a continuous, you know, kind of feedback. And, you know, that's one where for a long time we looked for sensing technology, we looked for algorithms, and and now we think we're there, right? We've got the combination of the, of the sensing and the, in that case, machine learning kind of te technology that lets us, you know, be able to, to do a really good job on on giving you a good indication of what's happening with with corrosion now, as well as what happened before and, and where you really are. So, you know, if I think what's the problems we we really want to do, it's always business problems, right? So that that's one. Um, the other big area that we're expanding into is, you know, a lot of people monitor a lot of the rotating equipment. You know, there's a lot of things, whether it's conveyor belts or fans or pumps or you name it in manufacturing that's got a motor in it. Those tend to be the things that fail the most, that have the reliability issues. Um, I think we've got the software down there. Now what we're looking to do is actually get the cost of the sensing and everything to the point where people are able to deploy that across all those assets. Typically they do it today on the very expensive, I don't have a spare, I'd be down for a week if this asset went out. We'd like to get that out across all the assets, right? And that's more of a, frankly, it's more of a cost you know, and packaging kind of issue right now to get it to the price point where people feel comfortable with it. Okay, cheaper vibration and motor braking sensors. Yes, sure that, motor that's braking. exactly what they're calling it. Broken motor sensors. Oh, motor braking, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, Karen. Uh, oh, use cases. I, I know that you've talked to, uh, about your use cases, but what are what would you like to do? What are the technical or the commercial yeah, sure. challenges? So uh, right now, you know, um, everybody's thinking about using artificial intelligence to replace humans or to automate decisions for humans. I think we need to do an intermediate step where it's assistive devices. I, at the end of the day, I want a human making the decisions, especially my life critical applications. Some of the things that I, you know, I, the computing, I, like I talk about the power, uh, the processing power, the memory space and all the things that you need to do, these algorithms right now, I can't deploy something like this on a drone right now. You know, and uh, you know everybody's talking about automated contactless food delivery. You know, to your doorstep via drones. I I don't I don't see that happening right now because we can't have the drone doing this real time computation that we need it to do. So we still need a human in the loop. So right now, I think the biggest thing is is intelligently using these systems to make to assist the human in decision making 
and to bring to light things that you might from tedious observation of videos and things like that bring out to a human but we also have to be aware of cognitive overload because if you throw in too much stuff at them you, you know you, it, tur it turns off after a while you just um you know you cognitive blindness i guess they call it uh, where you just tune out the warnings or whatever it is and you don't see it anymore so those are the big problems i see coming up okay julian i'm gonna get your problems what you'd like to do that you can't do yet but i'm gonna ask you to do it super fast because i want to get to questions very fast, yeah. Um, much like Karen said, we, we've been thinking about AI as not replacing the farmer. Uh, in fact, we came out with a statement recently and said, you know, I think the farmers will always be in the farm. And so instead we're looking at it as like, what are the things that we can sense and make decisions on, especially at the edge, that, that a farmer simply doesn't have time to, or, or it's in places where uh, it's impossible to get, you know, human eyes and ears there. And so, our challenges are then basically getting sensors in places where it's it's dirty, it's rugged, and making sure we train those algorithms. That's that's our path to scale AI at the edge. Okay. So, question from the audience: How do you guys think? And this is probably more for Peter and Julian, but you know, Karen, feel free to drop it. How do you think about the build versus buy? Are you building your edge stuff from scratch? Are you working with partners? How do you think that's going to play out? I Go, Peter. Well, I, you know, as I mentioned, I think most of our customers um, really are going to want to buy things that are, you know, the known solutions to the known problems more than than spending a lot of time figuring it out themselves. That, that's been our experience. Um, as it gets easier, as the tools get better, you know, we want to supply both. We want to supply those solutions. We also we want to supply open toolkits and do, as I already talked about earlier, supply open toolkits for customers to roll their own solutions because obviously there are many unique problems depending specifically on the process that they're working on that, you know, maybe there's only 20 of these machines in the world, right? And, and you know, that's not going to be a big enough market for us to go build a canned solution for and the, the customer or the, the OEM of that piece of equipment may have to be the only guys that can go in there and tackle that. So, you know, I, I think the markets that we see in manufacturing is largely around, hey, give me something that already works, but there is gonna for sure be that opportunity to, to build the custom solutions. For us, it's build. I mean, it's uh, certainly we're not, John Deere's not gonna start building cameras tomorrow. Um, so we are going to buy cameras, but, but, but I say build in that you really, again, when you're thinking about edge, intelligence you really have to understand how the pieces work together and you really have to try to control those interfaces between those pieces um, and for us that uh, we see that very much as build build those competencies and uh, and execute on them okay Karen if you have a, if you have a take feel free and that when when companies don't know how to do this that's when they reach out to the university and say we don't know we know what we don't know help us come up with an intelligent solution to make this happen so we do get a lot of of, of good contracts that way <laughs> oh excellent so so that's good that that build that build thing is keeping you in business mm -hmm. um, so, so another question is so much work needs to be done to get these analytics starting for the data doing the analysis is this profitable or useful for customers? And this actually, we've kind of touched on this, what kind of scale is needed? Uh, Y'all actually just kind of answered that. So I feel like, oh, it, uh, I mean, we're focused on the business case. Is there? Yeah, the answer is yes. Yes, <laughs> very profitable. <laughs> Next question. All right. How do you think about mobility? <laughs> An edge device attached to a machine with a, a power over ethernet versus a tractor roaming on battery in a field. I'm not sure what that, oh, mobility. I think they're talking about how mobile does your edge need to be? And there's actually in the event chat, there's a good discussion about smartphones being the most powerful edge computers there are. So I don't know if you wanna actually maybe dovetail into that. Like I imagine for many of your use cases, the smartphone is not well, why why aren't we using smartphones more for this? Uh, actually, we are, um, okay. and uh, we actually uh, in a lot of the the most more sophisticated agricultural machines that you step into today, um, we provide the option to integrate a mobile device, whether it be a tablet or a smartphone, into into the the vehicle, and uh, and and leverage the abilities of the smartphone to to assist. 
now, again, mission critical. Um, you know, do you want to not be able to farm in that critical farming window, you know, after it's been raining because your uh, smartphone operating system needed to be updated? No, you do not, right? So uh, we, we're kind of balancing that stuff, but uh, every farmer walks around with a smartphone. They, they are using the smartphone for all kinds of things. And we are, uh, and when I say we, the, the industry has, has really, really embraced the idea of mobility all across agriculture globally. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I would say for sure we are too, but we use the smartphone more as the, the interface and the connecting tool between you know, the data that's there or the data that the person is seeing with, with other systems that might be going on back office. One of the things you got to remember with the smartphone is in, in, in running it, if you're actually running the, the software there, or it only runs while the, while the person's standing there holding the phone. Okay. In, in our case, you know, people are looking for these applications to be running continuously, monitoring continuously, analyzing continuously. So the, the smartphone doesn't fit that model right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you need something that's that's permanently installed. Excellent. All right. Well, final thoughts. I know there's a there's some questions about use cases. I feel like we've talked a lot about use cases. Broadly, I'm going to think, hey, computer vision. So in your case, looking at seeds, uh, looking for weeds. Um, for you, it would be things like uh, anomaly detection on machines, so different sensors sending in data and saying, Oh, there's, I don't know how corrosion is, but um, I'm thinking vibration um, or steam traps. And Karen, yours is also a computer vision case in a lot of your examples. Are there others beyond computer vision and then broad anomaly detection that, you know, ML kind of machine learning at the edge, wake word detection, we haven't really talked about voice, but any other broad use case categories before we leave? nutrient sensing of soil very exciting field for us okay tell, tell me just like that no that's actually really interesting so it's like little sensors that are like oh there's potassium or whatever exactly exactly if you could tell uh, across your field how much potassium how many nitrates there are in every field you could actually make these really really interesting um decisions geospatial decisions about you know how much fertilizers to apply later in the year as a function of understanding the the the, the soil properties and it's a it's a tough messy complicated problem to uh to, to get right okay and I, I want to add one of the research problems i'm working on right now is you know how looking at bacteria in the food chain how, you know, you see how many people get sick from from contaminated foods. So how do you see something like that, you know, in the field where there's, you know, some of those different bacteria, And how do you track that back to the source and, and be able to mitigate that? I mean, that's a multi-billion dollar question. So that's something that we're looking at right now. Well, that seems like that might involve the cloud some, but okay. <laughs> so pervasive use of vision is certainly a good one, which everyone has talked about, but what about, and this is what pervasive use of, you know, acoustic. So, you know, we, I already talked about how we're using it for kind of very specific problems, but we also have a vision of where, you know, people just like in your own house, right? You know what your house normally sounds like, and you know what a, a normal sound sounds like in your house, right? And, and generally you're, you know, you track it down like, is that the refrigerator? I've never heard the refrigerator make that noise before. Is, is, it, how, is it okay? You know, and that same thing is true in manufacturing facilities, right? Is, is if we could use pervasive acoustic and machine learning and signature analysis to, to figure out things that are going on on a broad scale. Okay, this is gonna be kind of a weird thing, but it's basically like being like people. So you've got sight, hearing, yeah. I'm going to go with taste for the nutrient sensing, but that's kind of yicky. So I don't know how I feel about that. We'll call vibration touch. And I, I don't really have smell, but I'm okay with that. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming on. I was going to say for coming on the show today, but for attending the event, we appreciate you. I'm going to everyone give them a virtual round of applause. La la la. And I'm going to say goodbye and we'll bring up our sponsor, our, another one of our sponsors, Avnet. And uh, I'll just spend a moment while everyone leaves summarizing a little bit about what we learned before we bring up uh, <laughs> uh, our sponsor. And 
basically good discussion. We talked about the edge being a continuum. We talked about uh, the use cases, the business, needing a business problem to solve because this is still expensive. We talked about the value of having your own data. Uh, we got into a good discussion about, you know, weird things that I, I made weird by making it talk about taste uh, <laughs> in terms of the, the reason we're deploying machine learning at the edge. And so now, before our break, I'd like to bring up our sponsor from Avnet. And we have, hopefully, is Hari Kalyana Raman coming on? The answer is maybe. Oh, Hari's having a little bit of trouble. Oh, but here he is. Hari, welcome. I'm so glad. Yeah, my, right. my apologies. I had a, a bit of a technical issue there for a second. Oh, we are all learning. Well, please tell us more about Avnet and how you guys are working with machine learning at the edge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Stacy, and um, you know, hello everyone. As I was uh, listening into the the segment, a lot of um, you know good, vibrant discussion about the different um, use cases and verticals as it pertains to you know machine learning at the edge. And uh, Avnet today is um, excited to be a sponsor of this virtual event. At Avnet, we focused on helping businesses accelerate and uh, scale their IoT solutions in generating value-driven um, insights. Uh, we address everything from hardware, software, um, applications, and more relevant to this conversation, uh, AI ML models and any services that are needed to simplify um, the overall complexities of IoT. And one of the ways we do this is with our platform called IoT Connect. Uh, IoT Connect is a secure, scalable, enterprise-grade cloud-based platform that addresses common industry challenges with pre-built, pre-packaged smart application. There's a lot of good conversation before about, you know, the build versus buy and, you know, the pre-packaged solutions. That's something that, you know, we offer through our platform. And with a standardized way to harness IoT, your company can quickly build solutions that turn your data into actionable insights. Um, I invite this audience to learn more about our platform and our IoT partner program at avnet.com slash IoT. Um, thank you again for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your event. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hari, for sponsoring and for coming to tell us a little bit about you. All right, everyone, now it is time for the first break. Please come back at, uh, this would be 1010 our time, so you've got 10 minutes. Please feel free to rush over to the networking section and meet random people in the chat, or go to the expo and visit our sponsors and come back to us at 10.10. 10.